Okay, uh, we would like uh, to go on with the last sh session of the day. So we have uh, Nati Shaked from uh, the Biomedical Engineering uh, Department. Uh, he will talk about interferometric nanosensing and, and nanoscopy uh, of live cells. So uh, enjoy the talk. So thanks for the introduction. Um, the title is again Okay, now you can hear me better. The title is again Interformatic Nanosensing and Nanoscopy uh, of Live Cells and uh, Lithography Processes. These are two completely different worlds, uh, but the technologies that uh, we are developing actually can help in these two worlds uh, um, by doing that first better uh, and second easier, meaning that uh, there is no need for uh, uh, very expensive setups uh, uh, and uh, again, because we are doing that uh, more efficiently, uh, we can get this nanosensing and nanoscopy cap capabilities. So uh, at first, I'm going to talk about <coughs> the uh, technique advantages. Uh, we call it IPM. It's interferometric frame micro uh, microscopy. It is e able to image transparent and semi-transparent samples. And, sub, uh, and, and track sub-nanometric optical thickness sensitivities uh, thick, uh, in time or in space. And this can be done in quantitative ways. Uh, it can be done in thousands of full frames per second in wild field where no scanning is involved in a non-contact manner. It can be done label-free where no sample preparation is needed or, uh, and I'm going to talk about that briefly in the last slide, uh, a label based using plasmonic nanoparticles uh, and if this is done correctly, it is done with minimal level of noise and in ambient conditions, which, which means that it's good for live samples and in general, it's more easy to be implemented. Uh, and uh, these techniques, of course, provide us a, a quite unique and powerful tool for biological research, medical diagnosis, and second, uh, for material science in order to characterize micro and, and nanostructures, which I'm going to talk about uh, in the second part of the lecture. Um, so uh, this is a very simple schematic just to uh, let you know that the uh, technique is based on a holographic principle, um, but in practice this is a more com complex that, 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 than, in, that, than it is shown here. So in conventional transmission microscopy we have a sample. The sample can, might contain cells or it might be a, a, an optical element with the nanoscale thickness. Um, and we are using a white light. We have a microscope objective that magnifies this uh, sample. And we get the image of the sample, uh, which contains an amplitude here and a phase. Um, the sensor, uh, since it's not fast enough in order to capture the phase differences, actually makes absolute value square on this entire complex wavefront, which means that the phase information here is lost. So we're just getting the uh, uh, absolute value of, of, the, of the amplitude uh, square. Uh, in a phase microscopy, uh, what we are doing, we are using the same sample beam, uh, but then we here we are using a, a, a source with a certain degree of coherence. It might be a, a laser. It might be a little bit more broadband source, uh, but we have to split the beam and combine it again. Uh, usually it is done here. Uh, I'm going to show to you in this presentation that it doesn't have to be done here. It, it, it can be done in the output of the system, but in the conventional setup, this is called the Max Zender setup, we are splitting the beam here by a beam splitter and then we combine it again uh, just in front of the camera. So we have a sample beam interacting with the sample and a reference beam coming directly from the source. And because the source has a certain degree of coherence, uh, uh, these two beams interfere on the camera, so instead of just recording uh, O, which is a complex number, a complex wavefront, we are recording a superposition between two waves, the object wave and the reference wave. And again, the, the, the camera is not fast enough, so uh, uh, by, by its integration time, it makes absolute value square. But now I'm making absolute value square on uh, the superposition between two elements. And when I will open these brackets, I will get four elements. Uh, so you see that although I recorded the intensity here, 
uh, now its intensity of the addition between two waves, I was able to record the complex wavefront of the object, so because O is complex. Uh, and this happens because of this simple holographic mathematical principle. So if these four elements are separated in space, for example, by inducing a small angle between the reference arm and the object arm, I am able to retrieve this uh, object information, which includes the amplitude and the phase of the object in a single camera exposure when no scanning is involved. So the phase information is retained uh, in this uh, interferogram. Uh, I am able to record quantitative phase, and the meaning of quantitative phase is, in fact, optical thickness. And the accuracy that we get is very, very high. Um, quantitative phase, meaning actually optical thickness up to 2 pi over lambda, or lambda is the illumination wavelength. So let's say that I have here a sample, and it has a certain refractive index. It might be complex. I mean, it might change in space. It might be dependent on x, y, and z here. And uh, then I'm, I'm immersing the sample in medium, or, or either I have your air, so I know the refractive index of the medium, so this is known. Uh, I'm actually measuring the difference between the refractive index of the sample. The sample might be a cell, it might be an optical element, and the refractive index of the medium. So this might be water, uh, like cell medium, or air, so I know this refractive index, and this is unknown. And this is multiplied per each spatial point by the physical thickness of the sample. Then, if the refractive index of the sample is known, I am able to get a physical thickness map. This is a two-dimensional map, and it, in each point of the map, I am able to get the physical thickness of the sample. And this is very important because other phase techniques, such as differential interference contrast, DIC, or phase contrast, cannot retrieve this quantitative phase information. So the multiplication between the physical height of the sample, again, it's a 2D map, and the refractive index, it is called the optical thickness, or optical pad delay, or OPD. Uh, and the accuracy that we can get if we build the right interferometers are very, very high. I mean the accuracy in time and in space, meaning that I'm taking several interferograms and measure it in time, so I'm able to track very, very small um, changes in the optical thickness. And second, I'm talking about spatial stability, meaning that I have a certain phase image op or, or optical thickness image obtained without scanning. And then I'm measuring what is the smallest difference between two points on the same image. And, and again, the, the, the accuracy is sub-nanometric. Actually, if you build this type of, of, of uh, interferometers correctly, and I'm going to talk about what correctly means, uh, we are able to get 0.2 nanometers, and this is in ambient conditions without any type of labeling. Um, and if I'm able to track the, um, the optical thickness or the physical thickness, if I know any year in time, I am actually able to get stiffness or elasticity indication under the assumption that objects that fluctuate more are less stiff. And again, it's elasticity map. It's not a one-point measurement, it's elasticity map without uh, uh, bringing any props closing to the sample, just by shining light on the sample. So it's very easy uh, and non-destructive and non-intrusive for the sample. The problem, uh, and I think that this is why one of the reasons that this system, these types of system didn't get into the clinics, they start getting into the clinics but not uh, as expected, compared to other microscopy techniques and or, or also for low, low resources industry, is that these systems are quite big uh, and they are bulky and expensive. Uh, this is the first system built in my lab. It's in fact a Mark Zender interferometer. You can see here a beam splitter and other beam splitter. Two microscope objectives, a mirror here and a mirror here. The beams come from a laser. Uh, it's a low coherent laser, uh, and we are using low coherent laser in order to decrease the, the, the coherent noise and to get this sub-nanometric accuracy, otherwise I will have a, a spatial noise uh, uh, that will limit the accuracy of the measurement to several nanometers. Uh, so uh, this is in fact a Max Zender interferometer built vertically so that I can position the sample here uh, or horizontally. 
Uh, it has many components. It's uh, not portable. Its size is about one meter square. Its cost is more than 20K dollars. It's hard to use um, because in order to get the interference between the sample wave, going to the sample and the reference wave, we have to very difficultly align the system so I will get matching between this wave and this wave because I'm using a broadband source so the two beams won't interfere unless the optical pad delay of the first beam will be closely matched to the second beam up to several microns. So this is very, very hard to, 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 to uh, align, especially if the thickness of the sample might, be, might change the uh, optical pad delay. It requires a difficult al alignment, especially when low coherence or broadband sources are used. And uh, the bottom line is that it re requires an optical expert. And it's an open microscope, meaning that uh, I, will, I am building the microscope uh, 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 around the sample. Uh, it's not a commercial microscope. It's sensitive to noise. It's very, very sensitive to noise. In fact, uh, any type of differential perturbation between the interformatic arms, I have like different airflow here and here, will change the measurement in time. I, it will create vibrations in time. It requires an optical table to avoid mechanical vibrations. And in fact, it's not enough. In my labs, we even drill 60 centimeters into the, uh, uh, into the ground in order to isolate from low frequency vibrations because the optical table usually isolates uh, above uh, 10 hertz. Uh, and it requires a system enclosure in order to avoid this differential air perturbation. And again, it's very, very hard to align. You c I, I hope you can see here the retroreflectors. There are retroreflectors here in order to closely match these two beams paths uh, in these two interformatic arms. So I will be able to create interference with this broadband source. And this is the reason why it is not suitable for most clinics uh, that can use these unique advantages in order to make a, 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 a diagnosis, medical diagnosis, and for low resource commercial use because nobody can afford this type of uh, equipment and uh, uh, difficulty uh, of uh, operation. Uh, in, in his lab, in his, uh, at least in his uh, 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 biological lab or, or in, 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 in his factory. Uh, and this is why we lately came up with a simple idea uh, of how to build a simple box that can be ported in the exit of a microscope. It, in fact, doesn't have to be in the exit of the microscope. It can be an exit of any type of imaging system. It connects directly into the camera of the imaging system, so I don't need a special camera here, it's just a small box. It will be compact and portable. It can be positioned in the output of conventional transmission microscope or, or any kind of a coherent imaging system. Uh, it's inexpensive. It has a small number of simple optical elements. It's easy to use. No expert user is needed in order to align and use it, and it's very, it has very high performances. Actually, the performances of this small box, and I'm going to show you a comparison, is even better compared to these very expensive systems. I'm able to measure 0.2 nanometer uh, optical thickness in time and space while using low coherence and common path geometry. Common path geometry meaning that I'm propagating with these two beams, the reference and sample beams together, so that the degree of noise decreases significantly. So we call that the tau interferometer. We start by uh, calling that after the university, like TAU. But then the reviewer of the first pa paper told me that this is not possible to publish in university, so I changed it into the Greek letter tau, because the two beams interfere in, uh, the, in a certain angle, like, like the tau letter. Uh, so here you have an inverted microscope or any type of, of imaging system. And what is usually done? is that I was splitting the beam in the output of the laser. So it was in the beginning of the optical system. Here we are splitting and combining the beam only in the output of the system. So I'm having here a simple uh, 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 beam splitter, splitting the beam into two. And this is a mirror, this is a mirror. I'm going to get into that in a second. But then as soon as we are splitting the beam here, I'm getting here like interference between two sample beam because these two beams interfere on the camera. Now, from one of the sample beams, all we need to do is to turn it into a reference beam. The way that we are doing that is simply by special filtering. 
using Fourier optics. You know, a lens can do a, a Fourier transform and it's focused the beam. So this lens here takes the image, Fourier transform it, and here I have a mirror. And in front of the mirror, I have a pinhole. So I'm only taking the a, a zero spatial frequency from the sample beam. And effectively, what I'm doing is erasing the sample information from one of the beams. So now, instead of interfering the beams onto the camera with a, a, a two sample beams, which is not quantitative, because this is, for example, what is done in DIC, we have two beams going to the sample. Here, we are interfering it with a sample and a reference beam, because these sample beams tend to be reference beam by this spatial filtering. So I have here one lens and a second lens, and these two lens sits in 4F configurations, meaning that it makes a Fourier transform, erasing, spatial filtering, and another back Fourier transform effectively. And then they, they interfere onto the camera. Uh, and now we have to make sure that there is an angle between the beams, because we want off-axis uh, uh, geometry. The reason why we want off-axis geometry is because we want a single shot operation. If I'm using on-axis interferometry, I have to have at least three shots in order to retrieve these four elements that we show, I've shown you in the first slide, or the second slide. Uh, now, in order to create this angle, we are using a retroreflector built out of two mirror construction, and we are getting in an off-axis hologram, and this is close to common path. Basically, because all the way from the sample that sits somewhere here inside the microscope, I have only one beam. So I don't, like, accumulate the differential air perturbation. Then I'm splitting the beam and combine it right away. This can be very close to the beam splitter. So from the time I'm splitting the beam and combine it again, I'm only propagating through the glass of the beam splitter. So it's very, very stable. Uh, it's easy to align because these two beams are tightly focused. So I'm even able to illuminate the beam by low coherent source, by a broadband source, and still get interference by very, by very, very simple alignment. It has less noise. It's easy to align even with broadband or low coherent source. And again, it's close to common path, meaning that I, I do not accumulate differential air perturbation or differential noise. Um, now, the noise levels are very, very good, and this is the off-axis geometry. In the first paper, we had the on-axis geometry, and this is a coherence level of, of about 27 microns. Um, you can see here the spatial sensitivity, meaning that I'm taking several points in a, a, a single interferogram, and the OPD, or the optical pad delay, or the optical thickness, across a single uh, uh, quantitative phase map, or uh, optical thickness map, is about 0.5 or 0.6 nanometer. And uh, in certain conditions, uh, uh, I can even get 0.35 or, uh, or even less than that up down to 0.2 nanometers. Uh, I think this is the only method that can measure in ambient conditions, not in electron microscopy in a vacuum, to create a, a, a optical thickness maps in this type of accuracy. Now, this is the temporal sensitivity, meaning that I'm taking several optical thickness maps and measured it in time. We, we took a lot of them. And again, the sensitivity is very, very high, 0.5 nanometer, the average here. And if I'm taking uh, the middle of the interferograms and in which the uh, modulation of the, uh, the fringe modulation is high, because I'm, I'm using off-axis uh, illumination, uh, so the modulation is higher in the middle of the interferogram. I'm even getting 0.24 nanometer, which is very, very good. Now, we took it one uh, stage forward and uh, based on a Colton Foundation grant uh, given by the Ramot in Tau, uh, we tried to commercialize it, uh, and I'm, we are having a small startup company inside the university. We have three employees. And here you can see a, a size microscope, a commercial microscope, and this box sitting here in the output of the microscope. It is provided by real-time software. Like, in, in, instead of seeing the interferogram and going after that in, in MATLAB and retrieving the phase, uh, it's done, it do it in real-time, and it also gives the clinician uh, real-time information about the cell volume, the cell dry mass, the, the cell stiffness. This is how it looks like uh, uh, from the top. This is the output of the microscope. This is the simple camera connected here. By the way, this is the camera of the microscope. Uh, its current size is about 12 centimeters square. Um, this is how it looks like if I remove this box. It's like a simple beam splitter, a retroreflector sitting here. 
uh, and then the mirror with the pinot here. And the alignment, alignment that is needed to be done by the user is quite easy. It's just a single knob alignment. Um, the next prototype we are expecting is 7 cm. It comes with the real-time software. In the next stage, we hope to do it in the graphic uh, card of the computer, in, in the CUDA interface. And we are expecting uh, much more than a video rate for sure, uh, about 100 frames per second. Uh, and so the uh, clinician uh, will be able to see the face profile of the cell. This is, for example, a red blood cell in real time. So we have a lot of applications, but we are dividing them into two parts. The first part is biological research and medical diagnosis. And again, we, here we are able to measure uh, uh, the nanoscale fluctuations of cell in order to estimate their elasticity maps. Uh, there is no need to, for external labeling, no fluorescent dyes, no sample preparation is needed, and it's good for dynamic life cells. Uh, it's not like in electron microscopy uh, that you have to do it in a vacuum. Uh, so it's ambient conditions. Uh, this is how it looks like, for example, for red blood cells, no external labeling, and still you get excellent contrast. For red blood cells specifically, when you don't, do not have a nucleus, you can assume a certain refractive index per the entire cell, so you are able to get the physical thickness map per each cell in the field of view without any type of scanning in a single exposure. Um, and this is how the process looks like. This is, for example, how the interferogram looks like. You can see off-axis fringes. Uh, you can see very high modulation. And if I'm taking here a cross-section, you can see good modulation, especially in the middle of the system. Uh, it's a low coherence. So low coherence meaning that you cannot get interference on the entire field of view, but still it's quite wide field of view. Uh, based on that, you can get the thickness map. So the color here means the uh, thickness map, the physical thickness or the optical thickness. Depend, it depends if you want to multiply it by the refractive index of the cell. And based on that, if you measure that in time, you can get the elasticity map of the cell because cells that fluctuate more are less stiff. So again, we want to measure this phase profile in time. So now we have a time dependency. And then we are calculating per each pixel in the optical thickness map, the time-dependent optical thickness map, we are calculating the standard deviation. And the accuracy here, the vibrations here, might be sub-nanometric, and we are able to track them. Uh, and again, our assumptions that cells that are adhere to the surface uh, uh, will fluctuate, uh, uh, like softer cells, will fluctuate more than uh, 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 um, less, soft, less soft cells, uh, and uh, for homogeneous refractive index cells, such as red blood cells, this can be uh, um, connected to the spring factor uh, indicating on the elasticity of the cell. So the bottom line is that we are able to get elasticity maps for the cells, and this is, for example, a red blood cells from sickle cell anemia. Uh, so some of the cells change their morphology, and again, even if the cell doesn't change their morphology, we are able to diagnose sickle cell anemia uh, because the cells becoming stiffer, even if they do not change their morphology. Um, so again, this cell is stiffer than this cell, uh, but this can be also diagnosed by its morphology. But this cell, which looks completely normal, is stiffer uh, compared to a regular uh, healthy cell. So this can give the clinician another indication for the person having a sickle cell anemia and furthermore sickle threat, which cannot be diagnosed uh, very easily by, by, by just looking on the cells. Um, we took it one stage further uh, in order to generalize it for heterogeneous cells. So you know cells are not like bags of hemoglobin such as red blood cells. They might have a nucleus, mitochondria, and all of these organelles might have different refractive indices. Uh, actually, the nucleus uh, have higher refractive index. It's about 1.42. And the cytoplasm might have a refractive index of about 1.36, let's say. And the coupling, the refractive index, uh, and the physical thickness is some, sometimes not possible because the cell is the dynamics, and you get an integral refractive index on the entire cell thickness. But still, the interferometric frame microscopy, IPM, can give you stiffness indication under the assumption that the refractive index during the measurement doesn't change much within less than a second of measurement. And this is our assumption here when we try to measure the nanomechanical properties of cancer cells. 
And the assumption here is, is that cancer cells, when they want to metastasize, they want to spread themselves over the body, they becoming less stiff because they have to squeeze in, uh, to the narrow body capillaries. Um, so they are becoming, they make this a more, more stiff and uh, this assumption has been validated by atomic force microscopy and other types of quantitative microscopy. Uh, we, we, did, we did it with several uh, types of cell lines. Now we are doing that for, for, cell, for cells obtained by surgeries. But in this paper, we did, we did it with, for healthy cells and cancer cells taken from the same organ and the same individual. This is very important because if you are comparing two types of cells taken from different uh, uh, persons, it's not valid. Uh, and we did it for uh, primary cancer cells and metastatic cancer cells. And this is what we got. Uh, more uh, uh, results are in this paper. This is interferogram, and based on that, we got the stiffness map. So this is the uh, healthy cell and the cancer cell. And you can see that in the cancer cell, especially in the here on the edges, but also inside, it fluctuates more compared to the healthy cell. And furthermore, the metastatic cancer cell fluctuates more compared to the primary cancer cells. So the clinician that look on the cells, uh, might just take the uh, live cells and look at that under its regular microscope, connect, connect our portable device in the output of the microscope, and get a, met a metastatic cancer indication, which is very important because usually cancer indication uh, or cancer uh, uh, diagnosis is done selectively, uh, meaning that he, he, it looks to him like a cancer, but this is a quantitative measurement telling the clinician that this is a, this is a cancer cell. And we did it for a lot of cells, uh, uh, with edges, with, without edges, and, uh, and this is a, a comparison between the healthy cells and the cancer cells. So you can see that the healthy cells uh, fluctuate more compared to, uh, fluctuate um, less compared to the cancer cells. And again, the metastatic cancer cells uh, fluctuate more compared to the primary cancer cells. And we also validated by atomic force microscopy uh, in the nanocenter. Um, so these results are quite valid, and, and, and it's quite good that the clinician will have this additional quantitative uh, parameter to diagnose cancer and metastatic cancer. The second part, the second type of applications, is in order to control uh, or, or do non-destructive testing. And this non-destructive testing might be dynamic. For example, if I want to control a lithography process, uh, so we have here a dynamic quantitative imaging. No scanning is needed. Actually. I'm only limited in the true frame rate of the camera. If I have a camera being able to acquire in 6,000 frames per second, I will get 6,000 optical pad delays uh, uh, profiles, two-dimensional profiles, um, in 6,000 frames per second, very, very fast. So I'm able to track very, very fast biological or non-biological phenomena. Uh, we have here an uh, inexpensive, portable, and easy-to-use device. And again, it can be integrated in, in order to control lithography processes, and I'm going to show you several initial results. First, in order to characterize the tau interferometer, uh, we created in the nano, in the nano, uh, in the nano center um, phase targets, meaning that these are very, very thin targets on a glass uh, substrate. We, uh, uh, the contrast of this projector is, uh, projector is not great, but more details in the better contrast can be seen in this paper. Uh, we wrote here the name of our group, the Omni group, and our solution, the simple solution, inexpensive solution, the tau interferometer with low coherence source, with the broadband source, gave better imaging compared to the Max Zender interferometer with the low coherence source, which is very, very high to align because I have to uh, the, uh, uh, um, fit uh, the two beam paths uh, and, it's, and, and, and for sure, if I'm using a high coherence source, like a Heaney laser, I'm not getting anything here because of coherent noise. So only our simple solution can visualize uh, uh, these letters. Um, and we did make here a thicker um, line in order to show you that these three methods can see this line but couldn't see these letters. Uh, this is another... Uh, fabricated um, target. Uh, this target uh, usually uh, characterized in the nanocenter by SEM. So this is an SEM, a logo of the university. is a Passover a plate with a small plate here in the middle. So uh, the thickness changes between 10 nanometers to 300 nanometers. We created it on glass. So now it's a phase target. It's a transparent target. And again, our simple solution can visualize 
this uh, uh, plate much better compared to the Max Zender interferometer with a low coherent source, which is very hard to align, and the Max Zender interferometer with a highly coherent source, which is uh, easy to align, but again, get very many, many interferences here due to coherent noise. Furthermore, we are able to uh, control or at least uh, image lithography processes, and in order to do that, we build a simple photolithography process and uh, integrate it into our system in my lab. Uh, so it's not, it's not done uh, in a complex lithography process, but just see the potential. This can be integrated in any type of lithography process because it's a simple module sitting in, in outside, uh, just in front of, uh, of the optical camera inside the setup. So uh, this is a photolithography process of, of a mask uh, containing an arrow. Uh, and again, we're getting uh, the uh, optical thickness in real time uh, while, the, uh, while the queuing of the photoresist happens. Um, so it's, again, a, a quite nice tool in order to do non-destructive testing after the manufacturing, for example, for nanofabrication. And again, also during the manufacturing, uh, while not interfering with the manufacturing or the lithography process. Okay, so these are the two main topics that I wanted to present today, but uh, quickly I'm going to give you a snapshot about one of the posters that presented here, and we now have a, a initial good we results. Have the flash what? We have the flash session. The flash session. Okay, so I'm making another quick flash. Okay? So it's just one slide. <laughs> um, so uh, what we did here is just in, uh, to, do, uh, to be able to image gold nanoparticles. And I'm going to extend it further because the potential here is nanoscopy. Not only getting a molecular specificity for IPM, we might be able to get nanoscopy uh, uh, capabilities. So uh, again, we are taking uh, plasmonic nanoparticles. Um, this is by SEM, it's a 60 nanometer. We are able to see it by IPM. Um, in ambient conditions, we are able to take these nanoparticles and to, to label cells. And the way that we are doing that is just by looking on the phase change that is, is induced by illuminating the plasmonic nanoparticle in a wavelength that suits the plasmonic resonance. So these nanoparticles start to vibrate. These vi vibration cause a thermal change, like temperature increase, uh, which is very, very local. It doesn't hurt the cell. And then this temperature increase causes phase change that can be detected by our technology because our technology can image phase. Uh, and uh, the way that we uh, want to do with that nanoscopy is by using a localization base. Uh, so we are able to localize the center of the nanoparticles uh, in a similar way to what is done in palm and storm uh, uh, for uh, uh, fluorescence, but again, these particles doesn't suffer from photo bleaching. Um, uh, and again, you have a comparison. We, we can biofunctionalize them, make them attach EGFR or other types of, of receptors inside cells uh, and, and, and get uh, uh, and be able to record the phase signatures of these particles. By that, I want to conclude my talk. Uh, I talked about IPM, interferometric display microscopy, which is able to get optical thickness uh, and get sub-nanometric accuracy, label-free, without scanning, in ambient condition. conditions. Uh, we have proposed a compact and portable setups that can make life easier. Now I can give this box to a person that doesn't know anything about building the, such a complicated system, and he can use it. Uh, uh, in his lab, uh, the cost of this box might be 500 to thousand dollar. It's very, very minimal cost because it has very small optical elements and very inexpensive off-the-shelf optical elements. It's good for biological nanosensing by measuring the optical thickness fluctuations over time. Uh, we have characterized cancer and metastatic cancer. Uh, it's good for non-destructive nanoscale testings. Uh, in order to characterize uh, nanoscale accuracy thickness profiles of optical elements. Uh, I've shown here results uh, uh, with uh, transparent elements, but in fact it can also be done in reflection mode, uh, and even during lithography. And finally, I gave you a snapshot about our plasmonic nanoparticle project uh, in which we 
can label uh, and get molecular specificity for IPM that currently lacks this molecular specificity, specificity and also get transverse nanoscopy because I'm able to localize the center of the nanoparticle. Uh, so this is my group. Actually, uh, we have to update uh, this photo because now we have more uh, people. Uh, and I want to thank uh, my group, especially uh, Pinchas uh, and Tamir, which is involved with the Tau Interformator presented here. Uh, and I'm open for questions, I guess. Thank you. During dinner.